Hi. And uh, welcome to the Adelaide Festival's Climate Crisis and the Arts full day event um, addressing the climate crisis and how arts and culture can respond at this critical juncture. This session is called The Power of Storytelling and in a moment I will throw to each of our three speakers to introduce themselves. But before I go to that, I do want to acknowledge that we are meeting on the unceded lands of the Kaurna people today. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I also want to acknowledge all First Nations people, both here in Australia and around the world, as the first resistors to the climate crisis and also the people who are on the front lines. So I'm very excited today to be joined by um, three uh, presenters, one of which will be streaming in uh, very shortly. Um, Rona Glynn McDonald, Gabriel Chan on the far side, and Damon Gamow will be joining us shortly via stream. But I might just pass to each of our speakers in turn to introduce themselves, um, perhaps starting with you, Gabriel. Hi, uh, Gabriel Chan, obviously. Um, I'm a journalist and editor of the Rural and Regional Network of Guardian Australia. I've been a journalist for over 30 years. Uh, I moved um, from the city to a small town to a sheep and wheat station uh, in 1996. And so I've been looking at regional and rural issues since then, fused with politics uh, and uh, my latest book is Why You Should Give a Fuck About Farming. Uh, Rona. My name is Rona Numbala Glyn McDonald. I'm a Kadish woman from the Central Desert. My family's country is 300 kilometres north of Mbantua, Alice Springs, but I grew up there on Adamda country. My work spans economics, narrative change and storytelling. As all First Nations people, I come from generations of storytellers, but more specifically, I grew up around filmmaking and saw the power of cameras and lenses and shining a mirror up to Australia and showcasing our stories, our ways to really shift mindsets and move towards an Australia that celebrates and embraces First Nations people. I run an organisation called Common Ground, which is a not-for-profit that works with First Nations communities across the country to amplify our voices embed our knowledge in the education system and strengthen our stories through digital storytelling. It's a privilege to be here today on Ghana Country and I want to acknowledge the elders and ancestors that have held this country strong for generations and their sovereignty will never be ceded for generations to come. Thank you, Rona. And finally, Damon. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. A great pleasure to be here. I'm coming to you from the lands of the Bunjalung, the Arakwal people up uh, in the Northern Rivers and uh, what has been an extraordinary week for us and our community. And I uh, just want to give a shout out to just the amazing human spirit that has come to the fore in the last week up here. Uh, perhaps we can talk about that later. Uh, I'm a filmmaker as well um, and try and use film, I guess, to uh, shift and shape culture in whatever way I can uh, with a, a focus on regenerative storytelling, uh, inspiring people through uh, what we can do about some of these dilemmas and, and move away from nihilistic narratives that can overwhelm and paralyse and try and focus on getting people to feel what a better world would, would, would be like. Um, and so I've made a few films in this space um, uh, 2040 and now a current film called Regenerating Australia, which I'm uh, touring around the country at the moment. Thanks, Damon. Would you please join me in welcoming our three speakers today? <laughs> Rona, I'd like to go to you first. Um, in one of our kind of pre-discussions before this panel, um, you raised, I think, what is a really critical um, idea in regards to storytelling as it pertains to both the climate crisis and I think more broadly, which is who has power over the stories that we tell and where does our agency um, exist within um, those stories. And just before we came on stage today, we were um, uh, discussing um, a really kind of um, uh, tragic um, uh, development um, which crosses some of your um, language group um, and this is the single, the Singleton Station 
um, groundwater project that I was unfamiliar with before today, and I suspect many other people might be as well. According to Gabriel, it has had some coverage across The Guardian and the ABC, but I think this perhaps is um, a, a good example of how our storytelling fails us sometimes in terms of those that are most worth telling, but can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, when we look at storytelling as a medium, the first storytellers were First Nations people and, and stories were used as a mechanism to understand how we exist in the world, understand how we relate to one another, the obligations we have to look out for one another, the rules in society that can create harmony between our communities. But, you know, when we look at what's happened since 1788, those stories have been overrided by colonial narratives, colonial mindsets and thinking based on extraction and oppression and living in a world of me, not living in a world of we. And I think that looking across the way that we hold stories, First Nations communities have held stories for generations, but in terms of the Australian consciousness and who's holding power, it's definitely not with those communities that have been telling those stories since time immemorial. And for me, my whole work centres around how do we shift that? You know, how do we bring First Nations voices, knowledges and perspectives into the centre of the conversations that we're happening, having as a nation? And how do we ensure that the agency and power remains with the traditional owners and custodians of the land in which we live on today? And referring to, you know, the groundwater lease that's taking place on Singleton Station, there have been traditional owners and people from community saying, we don't want this. But where are the people who are listening and centering those voices as well? And I think that, you know, we're seeing things shift and we're seeing more and more First Nations people be centred in different spaces, whether that's in traditional media, online or on TikTok. I see there's a lot of young people in the audiences as well and it's pretty incredible to see how these new platforms are shaping ways that you know, someone who's living in the bush or someone who's living in a city can suddenly have millions of people not only hear their voice but act upon it. And we saw that very recently up on Bundjalung Country where Damon is and, and, and what that meant when there were people who weren't getting the support that they needed, there were people that were facing extreme you know, challenges, extreme moments in the floods and my heart goes out to everyone that's been impacted. But it took social media and it took people crying out for people to understand the context on the ground and for the government to step in. So I think that you know, in terms of power and agency, we all have power and agency, but we need to be using the mechanisms we have to ensure that all voices are centered in those conversations. And Rona, maybe I can just ask you as well to talk a little bit about common grounds work around um, languages, um, both restoring and maintaining languages, and also something I really wanted to ask you about as the father of a very young child, the, um, the, the Dreaming um, First Nations Storytelling Initiative that you've been working on. Can you talk to those a little bit? Yeah, so our work is about strengthening First Nations voices through storytelling, through building the capacity of younger voices coming through and creating opportunities for intergenerational transfers of knowledge in our communities. And that has seen us operate in many different spaces, but a lot of our work is in the education system. And a, a few years ago, we saw an opportunity to be able to work with elders and knowledge custodians in place-based context and each year we run a series called First Nations Bedtime Stories and if you have any young ones or even if you just like listening to a bedtime story I'm sure you enjoy these ones. We work with community, we, we employ and train local directors and producers to create five short films that tell stories that have been handed down since the mo first moments of time and stories that all people could be celebrating and those stories are mapped to school curriculum and they go out to about 200,000 students per year which is pretty amazing. We've been doing it for three years and we've done a couple of series in the central desert, one up on Nina country, up in the Kimberley and this year we're down on Wiradjuri country working with a local director and cinematographer called Jack Steele but the vision for this is you know 10, 20 years time we've got all these stories sitting on a map online and any community member from those communities can access those stories, but any person living across this continent can also access those stories and make sure that the next generation of young people grows up with knowledge and the centering of First Nations people and voices in their everyday lives. 
Gabriel, I'd like to bring you in here, and before I do, I should say that um, your book, Why You Should Give a Fuck About Farming, has made me give a fuck about farming in a way that I may not have done before as a relatively... Box ticked. <laughs> as a relatively alienated um, city slicker at heart. It, it, it's truly a, a wonderful work of journalism. I did want to ask you specifically about something that you write in the book, and this goes to our theme today of storytelling. You talk about what you call the experience factor, the taste of the food, the place that it comes from, and the story attached to it, the provenance. Now, I'm one of those people who gets incredibly frustrated when you look up a, a recipe online and you feel like you have to wade through 50,000 words of oh, somebody's no. life story yeah. before you get yeah. to the... Uh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, totally um, but can you talk a little bit about the importance of the story when it comes to food and this idea of provenance and that alienation I spoke of in terms of our relationship to where our food comes from in this country? Yeah, uh, I mean, the reason I wanted to do this book was really about to take a, a broader look at, at farming as a whole and its intersection with, I guess, the existential problems that the world faces. Things like climate change, soil loss, water shortages, you know, zoonotic diseases from, that cause pandemics, geopolitical trade wars, um, even, even down to, you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, while well, it ha it's happened recently, it's a, it's a sign of, you know, the fight over resources and the stuff that Rona was talking about, you know, with Singleton Station. And I think sometimes, as a modern people, we assume that things like food have been sorted because we can go to Coles and Woolies any day of the week and see this massive array of food, no. um, most of which comes from about 10 different ingredients. Um, folded in different ways um, and so I wanted to really drill down into kind of I guess the philosophical foundations but but the key themes uh, around farming and one of those is um, simply the way that we use land and and how whose responsibility is it um, to to look after that land which I think is a key theme through Rona and Damon's work too and that idea really interests me now because if you look at a First Nations approach to land, you know, it's not seen as something outside of oneself. It's, it's very much a kind of part of the equation, whereas the Western uh, view of land has been, you know, as property, a property right. I am the mistress of, of everything that's bounded by my fence. And I think the world is starting to wake up now about what that what that is meaning to take only the responsibility for that little piece as if it, it doesn't affect a whole lot of other pieces and a whole lot of other people and it interests me that the economy which has never valued um, what we now call natural capital that is the, the state of the environment and what it costs to produce food um, that has borne out bad consequences and so I thought, you know, looking at this, wow, if we valued that the way that uh, some governments are talking about valuing it and, and thinking of it as an environmental service that you pay for, that could be a really powerful thing. But now, already, since the book's out, I've noticed markets starting to move to create it as another product that you sell. And it struck me how that could go very, very wrong. You know, you, it's it's become a kind of ticket clipping exercise as a way to make money. You know, out of um, how how many trees you plant or those sorts of things. So, um, I just, I guess the 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 key message was, you know, that what we have to think about these things not only kind of emotionally but strategically um, because the economy is starting to take over that stuff as well. It's starting to give away, as the Northern Territory government is suggesting, um, 40,000 megalitres of water for intensive ag, mostly for export, and giving away that water for free underneath the ground of the people that live on top. And these sorts of issues can't be ignored. I, mean, I know it seems a hard to take, but uh, they're big issues and they need serious attention now. One thing you touch on in the book is the way that the COVID crisis 
really revealed the precarity of our kind of food supply systems. And it certainly feels like with the war in Ukraine that you mentioned and various other global pressures that we're probably entering a, a kind of new period of um, really increased kind of hardship and, and cost of living. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, that, that goes back to what I was saying about, you know, we think food is sorted. And I wish I'd said it first, but someone said, you know, we're only nine meals away from anarchy at any one point in time. I, I was going to bring that up because yeah. I always knew that as we were three hot meals away from oh, anarchy. But you're, you're quite slightly <laughs> right, different, right? right. It makes three, the same point. Three, three meals a day. Yeah, and, uh, you know, just reading the coverage this morning from the Ukraine, uh, in, in places now, they are fighting over food. And this is, you know, this is a middle class country that was very comfortable only weeks ago. These are, these are key strategic issues that we have to think about. Um, and now I've forgotten the question that you asked. Um, <laughs> I, I was asking about um, the way that COVID has kind of revealed our, yes, our yes. systems so, more precarious so, than we thought perhaps. So, you know, just seeing that live experiment over the last two years has been, I think, very powerful. And it has shifted governments slightly. You know, they've started to think, um, okay, we went through this phase 30 years ago, you know, with the rise of what we call now neoliberalism, that, you know, anything, we're really, we really should be concentrating on what we can produce well, and if we can't produce milk as cheaply as New Zealand, then we just buy it from New Zealand, or if we can't produce rice as cheaply as, we can, <laughs> as Vietnam can, we buy it from them, except in a pandemic, when they shut their exports off, as they did. You know, Ukraine and Russia are both responsible for 25% of the world's wheat population. A lot of that goes into the Middle East. And Egypt, for example, is very dependent on bread as a staple. If they can't get wheat, then that creates tensions there. And we saw the same tensions in the Arab Spring, you know, over food. That was all over food. So I think we have to take these issues seriously. They haven't been solved and how we do it uh, you know, in a way that honours both the land and the local people here, I think, is, is, is the big issue for me. So that feels like a good point to bring you in, Damon, because I know that a lot of your work touches on that. And um, in preparation for this panel, I, I watched your documentary in 2040, um, which was made in 2019, a year that seems both not very long ago and a lifetime ago. And as I was thinking about it, Damon, I, I wondered if I mean, 2040 is it's such an impressive sort of document, really, of your utopian imagination. And I wonder how much that imagination is tied to that specific time. I was just thinking about whether or not you feel like you would have made the same documentary now, because that moment that the film came out, which was early 2019, it was pre the Black Summer fires, it was pre the IPCC Code Red report, and now, of course, we have floods uh, wreaking devastation across the eastern states. I wonder if you, yes, I wonder if you could kind of talk about whether or not you feel like you would make the same film now. No, I mean, a lot has changed. I think even since we started filming, the, 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 the world's leading economies have invested or subsidised $3.3 trillion in fossil fuel expansion. Um, so we've just gone the opposite direction, and I think even uh, the, the, the emissions report came out only a couple of days ago saying we, we increased by 6% uh, last year. So uh, I think if I did the film again, it would still obviously focus on the solutions, but there'd be a lot more around, I guess, the mitigation that's required now because we've left things so late. And I think we're going to see that in our country in particular. We have to obviously move towards a lot of these new solutions, but at the same time, we're going to have to develop infrastructure to protect us from, from what is already coming. It's just that's the reality of towns like Lismore now where we might legitimately have our first climate refugees in this country um, because so many people, some of our friends, are not going to live there again. They're not going to rebuild. Uh, none of them can get insurance. Uh, even the big milk company that's been there for a long time uh, isn't going to rebuild there. So um, you could argue some of the bushfire communities, Malakuta and whatnot, are also climate refugees. So we're going to have to do, deal with those two things at the same time but what I would say is that I, I would still make sure that there was a strategic play to, to give people a sense and a feeling of what it would be like to get on top of this crisis. Because I do still worry about the overly nihilistic narratives that we knew, used, that the research is so strong on that, on, on how it can paralyse people, especially in this moment when there's so much to deal with. 
but it's very hard um, to bring people along if they're, if they're just hearing these, these messages. In fact, they retreat, they'll watch more Netflix, they'll have more glasses of wine because it just seems too hard, it's too existential. And that is a, a narrative that really suits the fossil fuel industry. In fact, some of them have been perpetuating that narrative in the last 10 years because they know of the apathy that it can create. So we have to be very strategic. Any artist, musician, songwriter, poet, filmmaker, whatever it is, um, this is our moment to get engaged, to shift and shape culture, but we also have to think really long and hard about how we're getting our messages out there. Because um, people just, you know, they're full. And the last thing they want to do after a big day of work is sit and watch a film about the reefs dying or another bushfire. Like, we get it. We know. We now really need to show people what they can do and how these solutions can benefit their own well-being, their communities, and, and their children's future. That, that's the story that's on offer right now, especially in our country. As many people have talked about, we just have an extraordinary opportunity to get right out ahead of the rest of the world and generate energy not only for our own country, but then provide our neighbours in the Pacific, Indonesia, start building batteries and wind turbines and, and, and solar panels for the rest of the world who are going to need it. We can do all that because of the wind and the sun we have. And then we talk about our landscapes and these very ancient soils we have. This huge capacity to build up organic matter, to plant differently, to grow native species, to bring the, the First Nations people along this journey and not make the same mistakes that we did in the mining boom where so many were left out of all the riches that we've gathered. Let's not do that again. Let's just make sure that we are very inclusive and, and holistic in, in these opportunities. But uh, we've got to get these stories out because right now um, we have a very controlled media landscape. A lot of them are in, run by incumbents. They don't want change. They want the status quo. And they are the gatekeepers of the narrative. And so we need our artists to penetrate through those gatekeepers and start offering up these different stories so people get excited, they can see what other people are doing and they want to get involved. Otherwise, if we keep telling stories of depravity and sacrifice, we're going to lose all these people and we're really in trouble. Um, at a Writers Week session a few days ago, um, yes. Um, I was at a Writers Week session a few days ago with the First Nations poet and editor Evelyn Araluen and something she said really struck me, which was that we should be thinking about not what art can do, but what should it be directed towards. And in her view, that's what she described as being the thing threatening everything I've ever known and loved, which is climate change. And then she went on to say that the highest aspiration for her poetry was to provide a moment of nourishment or energy. I'm keen to get um, a view on this from each of our speakers, but I might just start to you, Damon. What would you say is the highest aspiration for the work that you do, and do do um, Evelyn's words kind of speak to you in that way? Yeah, I love. I just love that. I think. Um, yeah, my my analogy is if if humanity is a forest and, and people are the seeds, um, then the culture is the soil, and the health of that determines how we grow. And so, the role of artists and storytellers is to shift and shape culture, and that culture then determines what thrives and dies or dies. And so in this moment, I really think that, you know, if the storytellers can't find the way, then the way can't be found. And I just bemoan that more uh, filmmakers and artists and big musicians aren't singing about this or talking about this as much as they are, um, because we're just so bombarded with information right now, these torrents of streams that we consume ourselves with, you know, headphones or podcasts or music constantly in our ears. We need artists to kind of rise above that torrent and take a breath and come back in and remind us of what's possible. We, we outsource our imagination. We outsource our dreaming now at a time when we need it more than ever. So, so that's the role of the artist, I think, to actually conjure a better world, what it would look like, what would it feel like, and, and get people in their hearts again when they're so in their head, they're so in their dopamine, this sort of triggered response that we're all living in right now. We need art to get us back anchored and in our hearts and start to think about a better future that we can all inhabit. Runner? For me, storytelling really is an act of healing and an act of resistance. And the work we do at Common Ground is really centered on that. I often say to my team, and like a lot of the young lords that we're working with, that if this process of storytelling and connecting with elders and sitting with country and telling your stories your ways isn't healing, and it doesn't feel like it's resistance, then we shouldn't be doing it. Like, if it doesn't heal you first, then how's it going to heal the rest of the community? How's it going to heal Australia? So I think that, for me, that 
that piece around who's benefiting in the art of practicing storytelling or in, in the art of the arts uh, is really important. And as First Nations people, our stories hold the answers, not just for our own communities, but for all communities as well. And a huge opportunity we have is to tell stories that enable people to make a mindful choice and to have agency in moving towards being better connected to country and being in right relationship with country and being in right relationship with First Nations communities. And I think storytelling is, is at the heart of that. It's the heart of shifting mindsets and shifting mindsets is at the heart of systems change. And I do agree with you, Damon. I think you, know, you do need to narrate hope and it is important to show that future state that we're all working towards. But it's also important to centre the truth and truth telling across this continent is something that we need to centre not just now but for many generations to come because we're not there yet and centering First Nations people across this continent to be telling those truths, walking alongside the rest of people living on stolen land is a, is a part of healing but it's also a part of our resistance collectively in how we build a better future for everyone. I, I tell stories to um, understand an issue myself and to try and explain it to others and I guess I find writing and editing a constant tightrope work, walk between optimism and pessimism and, and truth and hope and fears um, and I don't think it's any accident I've had two grandchildren in the last two years and it's really um, reset my perspective on um, the present and the future and I don't think that's unusual for, for people. I often see people very active um, in, in later stages of their lives uh, as well as young people um, and I think that my particular thing is that I write for an audience that is both um, progressive and conservative. So covering politics for, for you know, 20 plus years has, I've, I've watched the polarisation of politics. I've watched this kind of um, descent into tribalism and a, and a removal of centre, centre and a removal of common ground. Um, and that really worries me and I'm seeing it not just in politics, I'm seeing it in media, I'm seeing it in farming even, you know, the, the, the arguments between conventional farmers or regenerative farmers and what you call yourself and, and how you describe your farming system and that really worries me. So I think I try to... Um, to bring people along because I know I want both sides of those tribes to read my work. So I think really carefully about how I'm going to tell a story to honour people who may be doing things I completely disagree with and have views that I completely disagree with, but that I can still walk into the supermarket at the end of the day in my little town and have a conversation with them about their kids and what's happening. That, that is, seems to me a very important imperative for, for someone that works in the media and, and, and has kind of buckets of shit poured on them every day, if you like, you know, that, that really polarised, angry, angry discussion and, and trying to drag, trying to not drag people, but to um, find a way to explain things in a way that might um, hit their buttons, you know, exp explain it to them, um, I think is, remains a really important um, part of what I do, why I get up in the morning. I'm glad you brought up this issue of tribalism and common ground, and it's one that we did discuss in the lead up to this session. And one of the most important kind of thinkers and writers in this space for me is um, Amitav Ghosh, People might be familiar with his book, The Great Derangement, which came out a few years ago, which was essentially on his view that literary, contemporary literary fiction had kind of failed to engage with the climate crisis in a meaningful way. And he's got a really wonderful new book out called The Nutmeg's Curse, which picks up on some of the same themes. 
But one thing that he says in that book is that what the earth is really exhausted of is not its resources, what it has lost is meaning. And that was incredibly potent for someone like me who's been thinking a lot about my work as a climate activist and how I've seen, as we've always seen in a way, the almost radical success of these freedom um, slash anti-vax movements. And they're obviously plugging into an incredibly potent narrative, a, a narrative framework that is incredibly successful, whatever we may think of it. And I think that's also true, as we discussed earlier, of climate denialism. Again, whatever we may think of it, climate denialism has been wildly successful, and of course we know that it's been funded by incredibly rich and resourceful fossil fuel interests. But I just want to talk about this idea of where we find common ground and where that really important instinct to, to form common ground with other people can, can kind of go, go wrong or be misplaced. And I might throw to you first on this, Damon. Uh, yeah, well, you're spot on. And, and the idea of a meaning crisis, I think, is driving so much of what we're seeing right now. Um, religion isn't working for people. Materialism isn't satisfying in the ways that it was. So when there's a vacuum, people search for that meaning and they'll create their own meaning, which we saw during COVID. Uh, and I think, though, that um, you know some of these anti-vax movements, what it should show us is that you know people are desperate to connect and form groups with other people, and it's not. There are a lot of positives in that if we can get it right. I, I do agree what Gabrielle was saying before about this rampant neoliberalism that we've had, which has really eroded our community and our sense of connection with each other, and we've been commodifying everything. This is the result we get. So if we can rebuild community again, meaningful connection with people, because we're all craving it, and. Uh, the project I've, I've been doing for the last couple of years, we did an interview process for four months around the country with a really diverse group of Australians. And I was really shocked at how many things people said, that would ha how, how many things we had in common. Um, they, were, they were using slightly different words or slightly different language, but there was such a commonality between Australians that we don't really get in, obviously, our mainstream narratives and certainly not our algorithms. We're really polarised by that architecture, which, we, which is another conversation. But... When it came to it, the, the number one word across teenagers, uh, conservative farmers, indigenous groups, tradies, was this sense of community and belonging and connecting to people, wanting more of a say about what happens in their region or their community. So I think there is this incredible opportunity that we have to actually rebuild and reconnect that. And, and this, from my point of view, comes through this regeneration process of you know, healing our landscape, healing our land, land reinvigorating our communities at a time when we're desperate for meaning. What could be more meaningful than the regeneration of our planetary home? Mm. So if we can get that message out there, if we can make this something that uh, is appealing to people and we, we, we can display the benefits, because I, you know, a lot of us have met people that have got into this work and it's really changed their lives. They've found deeper relationships and connections. They feel like they're contributing, especially to climate, which is such a massive issue. Um, but I think that we have an opportunity to bring people together on this and more and more people are going to come to it. We've seen what's happened with the floods lately. The weather isn't going to let up. So this will inevitably be one of the biggest movements in human history because of the weather. Each time we have a flood or another event, more and more people drop their denial. They want to learn more. They want to get involved. So if we can actually create an inclusive place for people where they are welcome, no matter where they've been, coal workers, wherever, let's humanise this whole moment. I think we've got a much better chance of bringing people along. And, and again, that's up to the storytellers, up to the media, and I love what Gabrielle said then. Let's not demonise it. Try and find that common ground and that bit that does unite us, which is our humanity. And I've seen it in my community in the last week. It doesn't matter your race or your religion or your political views, people just helped. All that stuff dropped away, even egos, to just help their fellow human beings. And we are that. That is who we are innately but we are living in a system that incentivizes the selfish and greedy parts of us. We're largely led by sociopaths, so we have some big changes to do, but that's why I think we can get through some of our challenges because of our humanity, and we need to amplify that. Rona, would you like to respond to that? You just nailed it. I don't know what else I can add. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna be repeating what you said, Damon. <laughs> but I, yeah, I, look, I really agree, is all I can say, and I think people want to be in relationship, as you said, people want to feel connected, but I think the, the space that we need to hold is how do we teach people what those relationships should look like, how do we model it, and not just relationships with other people, but looking at relationships.
relationships with country and what does it look like to have right relationship with country, which is regeneration, but it's also reciprocity. And I think, you know, that act of keeping balance, like how do we keep balance? If we're taking, how do we give? If we're in relationship with someone, how do we ensure that it's mutually beneficial? And I think it's those values that we need at the core of shaping future systems in Australia. And that starts in classrooms, but it also starts in our conversations. And all of us thinking, not just in this frame of me, but we, and how do we collectively create futures that are built on mutual benefit? Gabrielle? Yeah, I, I would just observe some of the um, most optimistic solutions that I've seen. And one of them relates to Damon's stuff about regeneration. Um, you know, farming has been very fractured for the last um, couple of decades, mostly by climate and, and the onflow effect of climate. But the real optimism that I see, particularly in younger generation farmers, but also some older, um, is, the, is around the getting together. So it's around the WhatsApp groups of people who are starting to use um, what might be termed regenerative processes. And they become, while well, they start out support groups for um, different farming methods, they quickly become a, a, a sort of virtual community where everyone's supporting each other. And I think it's no accident that that kind of psychological and emotional support that that provides, they could be talking about anything, but it's, the, it's that, that connection over everything from farming process to kelpie pups to, you know, who's had a child to all of that stuff that has, has um, leached out of the system as as we've been pushed to keep producing more with less. You know, it's a, the last couple of decades has been all about the individual. It's sort of it's it's not even neoliberalism. It's kind of rampant individualism. You know, with with changing political ideologies. It doesn't matter what it is, but the the, the common piece has been that this idea of every um, person for themselves. And so, in a very disrupted world, it's the connections that are going to re-establish that. And it's it's the same on the south coast. My my aunt lost her home in Malakuta to the fires. Um, where they have re-established has been around those connections. Uh, I I did a story with a mob called Acres and Acres down in Coryong. Um, that was all about rebuilding the community in a reimagined sense, and they. That I don't think it was any accident that, it, that Josh Collings, the guy that was one of the main mover and shakers behind that, was about it was about going back to land. It was growing food on small plots in community gardens. Um, he still hasn't got his house rebuilt two and a half years after the fire, but it's it's those connections that are still bringing them together, and um, and I think there's a there's a real really strong lesson in that. So we are going to go to a couple of audience questions shortly. So if you do have a burning question that you've been sitting there with during this session, please start to think about heading up to the microphone in the middle there. And then after those questions, um, a real treat. Uh, we're going to have Nancy Bates up here performing a song for you, uh, which is incredibly exciting. Um, before we go to that, though, um, I am going to invite each of our speakers here today to offer um, a call to action, really. One of the, the kind of key um, overarching themes of today is to move away from simply conversation and these sorts of discussions as useful and energizing as they are towards what we can actually do in a practical sense at this really important and dire moment in, in our history. Um, I will go to each of our speakers in a moment, but I just wanted to kind of start by saying a couple of things on that. And one is that in South Australia, we've got two electoral votes coming up and that's really an opportunity to show our so-called elected representatives how we think about how they've been dealing with this issue of climate change. Now we've got a government that has not only once during the 2019-2020 bushfires failed in its primary duty to keep people safe, it is now doing it again in the eastern states right before our eyes. Um, I can't put this too delicately except to say we need to keep these people out. 
and we need to bring in someone else to give them a chance to do what they should be doing, which is to address climate change in all the ways that we've been talking about today. But that is not enough. Our ballot counts for a lot, but it doesn't count for everything. And my second call to action really is to um, borrow from Timothy Leary, and if anyone's read um, Scott Ludlam's book, they'll be familiar with this quote, but something Timothy Leary said is, who knows what you might learn from taking a chance on conversation with a stranger. Everyone carries a piece of the puzzle. Nobody comes into your life by mere coincidence. Trust your instincts, do the unexpected, find the others. Now our capacity for agency and for action is unevenly distributed, but one thing I would say is that whatever the solutions to the climate crisis are, they're not individual, as we've been discussing, they are collective. You're not on your own, go and find your people. And that's gonna be different for everyone. For me, I found my people in Extinction Rebellion, you might see some of their members around here today, have a chat with them. I feel like at this moment in time, Nonviolent civil disobedience is going to become more and more important as our governments continue to fail to do what is necessary. As I said, that's going to be different for everyone, but have a think about that as we move forwards from this really precarious point in history. And now I'll get off with my soapbox and pass on to our other speakers here today, maybe starting with you, Rona. Yeah, my call to action would be for everyone to be in right relationship with First Nations people and with country. and. That's not something that you know you can tick off, it's something that's an ongoing journey in everyone's lives. And for me, that looks like centering First Nations voices, embedding our ways of thinking and being in your lives, and paying the rent. Because everything that's being built on this continent is from the extraction, oppression, and stolen land and labor of First Nations communities. So it's time for reparations and reciprocity. And you know, in this climate conversation, there is no climate justice without First Nations justice. So send to First Nations sovereignty in all of your work. I would say petition your local politicians uh, for a minister for climate, food um, and land and, uh, and ask them to give it a budget that's higher than the defence budget. I see Peter Dutton is expanding um, the ADF by 100,000 people. Um, some of those could usefully uh, work on land and help in places like Lismore and other places. And to you, Damon, finally. Oh, look, everyone said it so eloquently. Uh, I, I agree with, with everyone and, and just the importance of this election, as you said, I think, um, you know, know your preferential vote more than you've ever known it before and understand how important it is at this election. We're seeing an incredible moment, even with the, the rise of these independents. Uh, if you're in those particular seats, um, you know, we had Simon Holmes at call on a panel a couple of nights ago at the film and he was just surprised at how well the majority of them are going and said that seven to nine of them have a legitimate chance. And so if we get three or five independents, actually uh, winning at this election, we could actually wake up to a very different country the next day when it comes to climate change. So that election matters, but so does your own agency. And I would just encourage anyone to find the thing that lights them up, the thing that they are passionate about, because when you align with that, then you are more inclined to talk about it, you share it with your friends, you want to be motivated, you won't want to give up after a short amount of time. And, and, and really, this is the moment. Uh, we have this opportunity now, and I, I often think of future historians looking back to this time and amidst all the nihilism and the species loss and the climate and the propaganda, that maybe there were a handful of people that actually chose a different direction and, and started to plant the seeds of a thriving future society. So be those people, get involved with that because this is a legacy action. We'll now go to questions from the audience. I think we have a couple. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, all of you, for a really good discussion. Um, as a um, retired soil scientist, I think I probably uh, found myself in, 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 in most connection with Gabriel's uh, presentation. And I remember there was a land care movement, which also brought communities together. And another thing is that why don't we just call neoliberalism greed? Because that's what it is. <laughs> now, a negative thing, I guess. I am ashamed and embarrassed to be living in Australia. 
Now, why is this? We have a terrible government, and it's an awful government. That's not all of it. I think it's also a ultra-nationalism uh, streak. Uh, when people uh, talk about doing something about climate change, you hear people say, oh, but we're only emitting some percent of emissions. In fact, we're emitting a lot more because we're sending coal all over the world. And, or, or, and also things like... Sorry, oh, can, you, can you bring yourself to a, a question? If you have yeah, time? okay. Please, we are limited for <laughs> time. Also, well, okay. Uh, my question, the other thing is that um, people say, we won't do anything till China does because we'll lose our standard of living. So my question is, do you think that the nationalism thing is pushed too far? Gabrielle, this might be a question for you. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I don't think Australia is the only place that that's happening. I think, you know, Brexit was a re as a result of um, nationalism too. Uh, you saw it with the election of Donald Trump, make America great, and make America great again. Um, so I don't think we're alone on that. Uh, and I think it's going to happen more and more. And I thought a lot, actually, in the writing of the book, the idea there's a there's a tension between rampant nationalism but also sovereignty. So sovereign, the idea of being more self-sufficient, um, being more reliant on our own resources in a very disrupted world. And I think as storytellers we need to really walk that line between those two ideas because tipping, if you, if you go too far, it can tip into that rampant nationalism, but I totally get what you're saying. And Landcare is now 30 years old, they have the 30 year anniversary, and I can tell you locally we're trying to reinvigorate it after it's been chopped and changed and had its funding extracted by this government uh, in many different ways. We'll take another question, the last one I think. Thank you, Neil. Oh, I hope it's not the last one. The, uh, you all talk about the, <clears throat> the need, the desire for relationship, uh, and Damon, you, you talk about the, uh, the, uh, the beauty of, of um, uh, the community's response uh, unifying in, uh, up in Lismore. I have, I have a dear friend who has joined, uh, and it feels like she's lost to me, joined the anti-vax movement, um, and I just, I, I feel this chasm between us and I don't know how to bridge it, I don't know how to reach. We can all, of course, do work that, that tries to, uh, to bring, uh, to create community and to, to bring people together, but it just feels that, that, that those chasms are becoming more unbridgeable rather than, rather than less. Can you suggest how to, how to reach, you know, how to reach across, how, how, how to, um, to, to stop that, that, uh, that division because it is only together, as you say, in Lismore that we, we experience um, uh, a response to the crisis which might be constructive. Mm. Um, yeah, thanks, Neil. Um, well, yeah, thanks for sharing that. I have a similar story of a really dear friend as well who, who um, has been really tricky to deal with during COVID. And for me, it, it, it it comes down to human needs, like beyond all this stuff, it's, it's reaching beyond the words and trying to feel into what that person is actually needing in this moment. Because we all, we're all needing something and we're not feeling heard and so it manifests in different ways. So that to me is the real humanising um, that we need to do. And that's difficult work, it's tricky. And, um, and Rona mentioned that, that we've got to teach people those skills, we've got to teach our kids that at our, at our schools. That is arguably the most important trait we need moving forward. It's not solar panels and whatnot, it's actually how we develop relationships because we have very rocky roads ahead of us, not just in climate, but a host of other factors because we've currently designed a system that is ripping us apart. So we need new ways of consilience, of coming together, of, of understanding and listening. And we need to embed that in our, in our curriculums at a very early age because um, it, it, it's just so important right now. So I, I don't have an obvious answer, but I just think it is the work. Victor Stephenson says it. We can't regenerate the country without regenerating the people. Uh, and that's uh, the difficult work ahead. I think that might be all we have time for in terms of questions. Um, so we're going to have Nancy Bates um, perform a song for us shortly. Um, after that, do stick around for the next session, which is Creative Responses to the Climate Crisis with Ali Baker, Tamara Bailey, 
David Finnegan and Caitlin Ellen Moore, moderated by Matthew Wright Simon. Before we come to that, can I ask everyone to warmly thank our panel for what I think we can all agree has been a tremendously invigorating discussion today. a deep and sacred connection. Right. 